is LT. I am a developer evangelist for Hack Reactor and Galvanize, um, and I'm really excited to be your host today. So we are with the uh, remote full-time Pacific campus, our uh, most recent graduating class. They've been working super, super hard for the last three months. Um, working on new technology, learning new technology, a lot of them starting from scratch and learning um, all kinds of new things in a really short amount of time. So we're talking HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, Node, React, uh, different databases and things like that. So lots of fun stuff. Um, pretty much the entire program has been a whirlwind for them. And we're really excited that they've now graduated and are ready to enter the workforce. Um, and so uh, basically what uh, happens is in the last part of the program, you do a capstone uh, project called uh, Blue Blue Ocean, and it is a team project where you basically build an application, um, and it is a full. Uh, it encompasses everything you learn in the program, and it and it is uh, a really great way to showcase all the new things that you've learned. And so, uh, without further ado, we're gonna get right into it. Um, so we're gonna kick it over to the. Um, to Team Arctic. So they worked on a werewolf game application and I am very excited to see what that looks like. So go ahead, take it away, team. Hi everyone, uh, we're Team Arctic. As you guys already heard, we were responsible for creating the game Werewolf. For those who aren't familiar with the game, well, we're it's similar to Town of Salem or Among Us where there are innocent players and enemies players. Basically the innocent players who do not have access to the roles of each player are responsible for sussing out who the werewolves are, and the werewolves are the enemies who vote at night and try to figure out who they want to kill off. Once the number of werewolves is equal to the number of villagers, or the werewolves have been extinguished, the game ends. There are some interesting constraints with this application, given the fact that we needed to have several different parameters, namely day and night cycles, timers, a live dead status for each player in the game that's shared globally, also individual player parameters, such as roles and voting, which change the information available to each client. And given the nature of the application, we decided to go with object-oriented design principles. So for those who are familiar, basically we have a game class we can instantiate at any given time with the parameters that are available globally. And we have methods attached to that object that update those parameters. We also have a player class that gets, gets instantiated every time a new client connects to the game. And that populates the game class and that has all those players' individual parameters, such as their role, their live data status, et cetera, et cetera. We think this decision definitely enhanced the modularity of the application and then simplified the game logic. I'm going to pass it off to Chris so he can talk a little bit more about that. Hey, everybody. My name is Chris McVeigh. I was on the team for this that uh, was primarily tasked with creating the game logic and the basic game loop in the back end. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go us, uh, walk us through a very, very short demo of the game and talk a little bit about what's happening in the back end. All right. So this is deployed to AWS, Amazon Web Services. So this is available to everybody. If anyone wants to play a game later, message one of us, we'll send you the link, we can all play. Um, but I have it uh, here with seven instances open. So we have seven players in the lobby. So to give you a, a real quick version of what's going on before we get into the game, essentially what's happening is there's the game state that Alex was talking about. All the players get put into that game state and that game state gets passed around between four different places. One is the lobby, that's where we're at right now. The next place it's gonna go to is the pregame. That's where everyone gets to see what their role is, werewolf, villager, whatever. And then it goes to the game loop, which is getting passed between the day phase and the night phase. And really what's happening is, is the back end, the server is updating all of the game information and sending that game state out to the front end clients, which is rendering the whole game. So let's see how it works. Once everybody's in, you press play, you get sent to the game lobby where a timer is counting down for everybody. It's all synchronized, as you can see. Each person has a different role. This person's a werewolf, this person's a seer, this person's a villager. And this is the time when everyone gets a talk, kind of strategize, figure out what they're doing. You can see who is alive and who's dead in the current player list. Once we get to the night phase, then the werewolves are all voting on who they want to kill, right? They can talk to each other in the chat box here, which can only be seen by the other villagers. And you can see we're going from a day phase to a night phase. Once we're in the day phase, every single person gets to vote on who they think the werewolf is, right? And essentially what's happening is every time there's a new phase, right? The game behind the scenes is checking to see if the win conditions have been met. And if it hasn't, it just passes it to the next phase. And we go on and on and on. And so what's going on now is, as you can see, we're down to one werewolf and three villagers. People are dropping like flies because I've set the timer really, really fast <laughs> for the purposes of the demo. 
And then on this night, there's only two villagers left. And so when the villagers equal the werewolves, the win condition will be met and the game will throw us into the end game, which is where we are now. And that explains the whole game loop. And I'm going to pass it off to Jonathan now. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jonathan. I worked on login functionality, adjustable game settings, and game in progress logic. So let's take a deeper dive into the wonderful world of what the heck Socket.io is doing in these features. So for login functionality, the challenge was populating the list of logged in users that you see here across all client instances as they log in. So to accomplish this, I set up a series of Socket emits and listeners. So on login, the, the, the client emits to the server the player name. The server then populates that list of player names that it has, and it emits this updated list to all of the clients, updating their rendered list of players. The same thing is happening with these settings, the, the settings up here on top. It works in the same way as React controlled components, but instead of changing an individual client's state on change, it's emitting these changes to the server, which updates its settings object, and then emits that updated setting to all the clients, updating their states of, in their components. So uh, after that, another challenge involved handling what happens when clients are logged in, or if a client joins in the middle of a game. Uh, we wanted to ensure that the game can run smoothly in either of these cases when the game starts. Uh, if a client is not on the list of logged in players, the server will emit to those clients that the game has started without them. Uh, the clients who are not logged in will then render to a waiting screen. And when the game is over, the server emits to all the clients, logged in or otherwise, that it's ready to display the lobby screen and it's ready for a new game. So overall, the main challenges with sockets is just setting up these listeners and triggering the emits at the correct times to, to keep all the clients up to date. Now off to Danny. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so yeah, my name is Danica, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the end game and reset game logic. And just like for everything else, um, two of the main things that we utilized here were socket IO and object oriented programming. So like we already mentioned, we had the game and player instance of a class that contained all the data required to have the automated gameplay and keep track of the progress of the game. And once the conditions for end game were met, this was checked on the server side. And so then the server would emit an end game message to all players and based on this, the end game module is dynamically rendered. So if the players choose to reset the game, the game object is then reset on the server side. And that changes all the alive dead status of the players, the roles, the game status, status, et cetera. And so in the meantime, it saves the player login information. So if you want to start a new game, you have this saved in the players. And after that, the players and including the ones that joined the, the game while it was in progress, they would be taken to the lobby to start a new game. And uh, that would be briefly about the reset game logic. I'll now popcorn it to Irene. Hello. Um, so I'm going to be talking about werewolf chat. So in the game, this game is traditionally played with all the players in the room. Um, the players would close their eyes and the werewolves would point at who they were going to kill. Um, so we wanted to create, simulate that, that werewolves would have the opportunity to communicate with each other. Um, we took advantage of socket IO, um, which in that real time communication that established open connection between our server and client um, so that the werewolves could talk to each other throughout. We also um, used a lot of conditional rendering, rendering on the front end in our game because while it looks like there's a lot going on, there's really only two screens. We have our login screen and our game screen with um, some pop-ups and conditional rendering in React. And with that, I'll pass it off to Robert because he is our animation master. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Robert Strange. So uh, just wrapping up here. I work predominantly on the front end and the styling. And then considering that the attention of the, uh, the user would be split between the video aspect of the the game and then the app, we wanted to make sure that the app had a really rich, tangible feel. So there's quite a few things that we added to achieve this effect. Namely, the, the day and night transposed image is it's absolutely beautiful. It was all Irene that found that one. And then the, the sun and the moon animations, which I built out of React Frame, or uh, Framer-Motion actually. And uh, yeah, this gives it this really 
really nice village feel, right? And then there's also things like the, the click sounds on all the buttons, as well as the growling wolf in the very beginning, which uh, ominously follows your cursor. All in all, I think we came out with a really, really nice product. And that is our presentation. Thank you so much. Let us know if you have any questions. Thank you guys so much. That is extremely impressive. I am I am so thrilled to see this and thank you so much for presenting it. Please, if anyone has any questions about this, feel free to ask the team. We just ask that you put it in the chat so that way we can um, you know, read it off and make sure that uh, everyone has a chance to see it and can answer to it. So if you again, if you have any questions for this team um, or any of the upcoming teams, feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, I have a, a quick question for the team. How did you guys decide who was doing what that was actually probably the hardest part because <laughs> there's so many fun things to work on um so you know some of us gravitated towards some things naturally i think like robert has a real flair for front-end design and so he he kind of decided to take the lead on that i i had a kind of a pre-existing image in, in game development and game design so i really wanted to work on on the back end but other than that it, it was mostly kind of education driven like whatever we wanted to learn most like some people really wanted to learn about the socket system and how to do multiplayer connections and so they did that whether they had any experience with it or not so it's a mixture of those two things Awesome. And a question from the chat. How long did it take you guys to complete it? Like realistically, we probably only had about three days, like three solid days of work on this. That's incredible and phenomenal. How were the graphics created? So you touched on it a little bit, Robert, but when you were creating all the animation and things like that, can you break it down for someone who maybe hasn't had any coding experience? Yeah, absolutely. So I utilize a library called Framer Motion, and it, it's really nice. So a, a lot of different libraries, they typically, like for simple animations, it's just duration based, right? So it's like one, two, three, four, and that's extremely unnatural. Like nothing, nothing in reality moves from position A to position B perfect with perfect acceleration, right? So I utilized what's called a spring type duration. So instead of simply starting at a pace and continuing through that all the way through, they start off slower, gain some momentum, and then typically overshoot and bounce back. So it just gives it a bit of a more realistic feel to it. Thank you very much. Um, is there a max to how many people can join the game? No, no max. Wow. Are there yeah, only the, the, the only real limitation is if you have too many people, it might get a little unwieldy communicating and talking to each other, but there's there's no technical limitation. The only technical limitation we found was Socket.io can supposedly support up to 2000 players. Did you test it? <laughs> no, we did not test that number. Got it. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, we mocked a bunch of players. Sorry, I was going to add. I think we got up to like 50 that we put in there, and that seemed to run, but we haven't gone beyond that. Yeah, that's awesome. I would, uh, yeah, I would just say good luck playing with 2,000 players. I think that that would be absolutely horrendous, um, but glad to know that it could support it if you wanted to. Um, awesome. Well, if there are no other questions, then we'll go ahead and move on to Team Atlantic. Um, just for everyone, yeah, um, if if you have any more questions, definitely put them in the chat. And then if um, we have some time at the end, we will get around to it um, once everyone has gone through. But we want to make sure and give plenty of time for all the other teams to present. And so if we need to come back to any questions at the end, if we have time, we totally will. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and move on to uh, Team Atlantic. Take it away. Good afternoon. We are Team Atlantic. My name is Tom Matson. I was the project co-lead along with my teammate Kyle. You meet him here in a little bit. And this is Help Me Out. So Help Me Out is a community-driven social media-based project, tool, and resource sharing platform. It allows users in a community to share whatever home project they are working on and also select if they are in need of assistance. Likewise, if you are an expert in your area and you wish to help people out, you can see which projects need assistance and see if you have tools you can lend them or just want to lend a hand. And users can message each other directly to give or receive assistance. Users can also be endorsed by other community members and reach an expert status. And that's how you would know that's the person to reach out to because a bunch of people in your community agreed with that. And our application is also location-based. So you will only see 
uh, projects and experts in your direct neighborhood. And to sign in, you hit this little continue with Google button. And with that, I will pass it to Timothy, who can give you a little more information on that. Hi, I'm Timothy Newman, and I was responsible for authentication and routing. So authentication was done using Google OAuth. And if we click the button here, it will then route us to the main feed. And for routing, I used React Router, which listens for paths and renders a particular component. And then I also use History, which is an object that I attach to my app's props. So if we click different paths here, we can see the paths changing on, on top URL. And then the component on bottom will change depending on the path. But a big, a big challenge I faced was getting the app to reroute after successful authentication because the app has to change paths without anything being clicked. So I did this by pushing the path as a string to the history object, which my router then listens for and sees the change and it'll render the corresponding component. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pass this off to Kyle and to the main feed. Thank you so much, Tim. My name is Kyle Johnson. I was responsible for this main dashboard here. Not the individual cards, mind you, but the overall structure of the page, the application, as well as the filtering functionality here. As you can see, we have our main home feed, which lists projects that you can assist with, as well as tools that you can, uh, that, that you can get from others in your area. We can filter via projects that you can give help to, tools that you can receive help from. And of course, if you've marked a project as your favorite, it will appear in this list as well. Uh, my primary challenge in all of this was actually balancing the demand of the front end with the supply of the back end. I had to shape data as it was being given to me into what was necessary for each of our cards here. There was a, a certain point in the process where I realized that we needed user data, such as profile pictures and usernames associated with each of our entries. But currently all we had at that point was project data, such as descriptions and names and tools. So I was able to render some dummy data and pass that along as necessary. And meanwhile, go and talk to the people on the back end and request that API calls return something else. And in that way, I was able to maintain a, a solid grasp on the application as a whole and keep everyone moving forward efficiently and in a balanced way. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it off to Edwin to talk about the individual cards in our feed. I appreciate that, Kyle. Uh, hi, my name is Edwin, and I was uh, responsible for creating the components that would uh, populate the feed section of the app. My component's role uh, is to display relevant information about the projects or the tools, as well as offer up some interactivity. Here we can see that uh, we can see the project or tools name being displayed, as well as you can see the project's uh, description and the project owner's name and their handy score, uh, which changes based on their handy score rating. Uh, of course, we also have the upvote and downvote button, the upvote for when you like something and the downvote for uh, if you don't. Then we have the favorites button for if you really like something. And then we have the messaging and the report button. And uh, with that, I'll pass it up to uh, Michael. Awesome. Thanks, Edwin. Hi there, I'm Michael Barton. And I was mainly focused on the chat and inbox features of our application. Our main feed features message buttons that when clicked, bring up a live chat window to communicate with other users in real time. The app also includes a dedicated inbox to see the current user's message history and send communications to users who are offline as well. I had one significantly larger technical challenge that I worked through for this project. I implemented the messaging feature based on an external library named Talk.js and needed to find ways to add additional functionality beyond what was initially provided by the package. Some control options were made available for adjustment, but I had to be clever about my manipulation to achieve an enhanced user experience for our application. I constructed a series of actions to achieve this elevated functionality that I wanted, but a more advanced method I executed to work towards this challenge of library manipulation involved entirely removing a component from the DOM at a specified node and then rendering a fresh container in its place to prepare a target for the component to be mounted again which would effectively refresh the active state of this feature. So I utilized the React DOM unmount component at node tool um, to safely remove the element that I needed to reset. 
Directly interacting with the DOM elements outside of React's provided methods can negatively alter the application state and introduce unexpected errors. So by leveraging this React DOM function, I was able to achieve the result I wanted without introducing unnecessary complications. And I was able to continue building an effective solution for developing the additional functionality I was looking to create and still benefiting from the external library that I utilized. And now I'll be passing off to Gareth. Thanks, Michael. I'm Gareth. Uh, I was in charge of the user profile for Help Me Out. So on the profile, you have your profile information, then you have your projects so far and your tools. Uh, there's also forms to add new projects uh, and add new tools, as well as alter the ones you already have. Uh, the biggest technical challenge for this was probably um, effectively storing the information together. Um, you can upload files from your own computer. And what I do is once they're loaded, I send them up to a hosting platform called Cloudinary. It runs a URL, which makes uh, storage really easy so they can be recalled for later use. Um, next, we're going to go to Krista. Hello, my name is Krista Brock. I built the uh, backend system of our application. Uh, one of the unique constraints we had in this project was the need to render our user feed with information that was only relevant to the logged in user. Uh, for example, once you're logged in and the tab is selected, uh, you should only see projects of others that need help, but only if you have the available tool to help them. Uh, likewise, you for the give help tab, you should only see users that uh, have the tools you need for a project that you need help with. Uh, and all of this needed to be filtered by location as well. I saw this on the back end by creating a system of functions that grabbed all the required user parameters and their corresponding site matches from MongoDB. Uh, then I used Mongoose's populate to fill in the relevant paths by selecting the appropriate fields from the matched users based on whether they're needing to give help or receive help. Uh, then the relevant information was sent to the front end sorted by zip code and most recent posting. I'll pass it back to Till to talk a little bit about the challenges we faced as a team. The biggest challenge we faced as a team, thanks Krista, um, was just coordinating and making sure everyone was on the same page and that we could maintain consistency throughout our application. And we approached that by using a number of different techniques. We did a daily standup as well as an additional check-in in the afternoon to make sure we were on the same page. And we also worked in a shared workspace which allowed us to easily jump on a call with any specific team member you needed to work or collaborate with and continue the project in an efficient manner, which allowed us, allowed us to reuse a good amount of code and build a very efficient application overall. Uh, that about does it for Help Me Out. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, team. I'll let um, everyone kind of gather their thoughts while they're thinking of their own questions. But as usual, I also have my own. Um, was there anything about this application that you guys would have liked to have done, but ultimately just didn't have the time to? Anything you had to scrap because of time limitations? Uh, we were yes. initially, go ahead, Krista. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, we really wanted to get the live data working. Um, I actually did uh, build the functionality for that, um, but uh, we were not able to get that implemented in time for a, a demo. Thank you very much. Uh, Gary is asking, what did you use to build the chat feature? Michael, would you um, maybe go into that in a little bit more detail? Just basically what, um, what applications you're using for that or what services you're using? Yeah, definitely. So for the chat, I use Talk.js, um, which is a library that provides a lot of these features out of the box. Um, it makes it really simple for being able to essentially just connect user IDs and other information from a logged in user and from other users in the site as well to be able to uh, communicate back and forth in a couple of different ways. Um, the more challenging part about it is that a lot of it is prepackaged and kind of direct in how it's being served to you. So um, being able to manipulate that was a little bit more challenging to get the detailed animation of the pop-up window appearing um, and functionality like that. But overall, it's a very, very useful tool as far as getting the functionality up and running very quickly. Um, it was more of the customization that was took more effort. Thank you. Um, and Taryn is asking uh, the 
is the Talk.js data stored in the database? Ours is not currently stored in the database. That is a uh, functionality that is possible, absolutely. But um, it also includes uh, storage within their own database on the Talk.js side. So you can log into your account online. Um, and that's where a lot of backend um, adjustment is able to be made as well, is in those settings in your Talk.js account. Thank you. I also have a, a direct question. Um, in terms of working as a remote team that presents its own challenges, what was your preferred um, method of collaboration throughout the day as you were working through this? So we worked in Discord for the most part, which their call functionality is just pretty on point for that. We could, you know, you can just jump into a call and mute it. And if you need someone, you can just unmute and be like, hey, I need something. There's also messaging, which allowed you to really easily ping your teammates and just jump into a call. That's great. Um, I to add on to that, I think it was useful to simulate a, a real, a, a real quote unquote work environment or a live in person one where you can be available uh, as necessary. Got it. So even though you guys were working separately and on separate things, you were pretty readily available to each other as if you were sitting next to each other. Awesome. Correct. Thank you so much for um, running through those questions with us. I again, if anyone has any additional questions, we will definitely get to those at the end. So just keep throwing those in the chat. Um, thank you teammates for uh, answering in the chat. That makes everything a little bit smoother and um, probably a little clearer. Uh, so let's move on to Team Pacific. Take it away. Hello, so we are Team uh, Pacific, and um, we have Austin T, Austin E, Taryn, Lara, Chandler, Sam, and myself. Um, Pacific Microphone is an app designed to help actors hone their craft in various ways. So we're going to start off with a quick demo by Taryn. All right, so right at the beginning, we get our, our million dollar moment here, which was specifically requested from the client. Um, we've got account-based authentication through OAuth, and that allows you to have your own stored scripts. You can also add new scripts if you'd like to write things in here. I'm not going to go through the process because I'm not a very good writer. Um, so our main app is set into three different functionalities. We have a script analyzer, which will allow you to select a script and click on each sentence and see what IBM's Watson computer believes the tone of that specific sentence to be. Uh, we have our voice analyzer. This allows you to make a recording of your spoken word, whether that's a monologue or a speech of some kind, and uh, sends that out to multiple places for data analysis. You can play it back. This allows you to make a recording. It also gives you a transcription of what you said and provides you with the emotional context of your voice, not the words you said, but the actual emotional content of how you spoke over time during that, that uh, speech. And our third section allows you to take a script, pick a role, and then back and forth with the computer. So if I'm Bernardo, I think I picked Bernardo, I would say, who's there? Who's there? No, I didn't pick Bernardo. Nay, answer me, stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. And so you can back and forth your scripts with the computer to allow you to practice at home during a pandemic. Uh, on to Austin, or uh, yeah, Austin Testit to talk about authentication. Thanks everyone, I'm Austin Testit. My first big challenge here was setting up the actual authentication for the app. We wanted to use Google OAuth because it would make logging in really easy for users. So I registered our app with Google and then used Passport.js because it builds in a lot of the OAuth and user serialization. I also used the cookie session library to store authentication cookies in the user's browser. This authentication worked great, but it also posed another issue, which is that I needed to send the user's name and a uniquely identifying credential to the client for use in state. Uh, while the user would be sent already with requests to the server, this didn't really allow us to do things like display Taryn's name in the top left of the screen. Uh, because Passport redirects to different routes, including to Google, it would cause cores issues if the client made an Axios request for authentication. So to get around this, I left the authentication process the same 
and had the client actually check to see if a user had already been authorized when the component mounts. If a user had been authorized, the Axios request would be able to find the user's name and database ID and then save it in state so it could easily be used to create and delete their scripts. Now I'll pass it on to Austin E to talk about the script analyzer. Thanks. So um, I worked on getting the script data um, provided by the user into the various forms that the app needed. And this was an interesting challenge because several parts of the app needed the same data, but in different shapes. Um, for instance, the live practice part of the page requires a character list so that um, we can create a, a drop-down menu where the user can select which character they'll be playing. Uh, whereas the script display needs the script split into chunks based on the character and the chronology of the, of the script. And then finally, the IBM Watson API requires just this, the sentences that we want to analyze for tone. So we had to create basically a monologue of the entire script with no uh, character names in it at all. And so the solution we arrived at was to uh, split the data into all the forms that we were gonna need as soon as it was submitted and then store those pieces uh, in efficient ways and um, also allow each component to access exactly uh, the shape of the data that they needed. Uh, and this allowed us to maintain consistency throughout the app and re reduce any um, duplication of features or code. And now I'll pass it off to Taryn. Right, uh, so I was primarily focused on creating the audio interaction portion of this application. Um, this was, we were initially planning on sending out our audio to the IBM Watson AI to analyze the emotional content, but unfortunately it does not have that feature just yet. So we scoured the internet to find another endpoint. Uh, we found one called Web Empath which did exactly what we wanted, but unfortunately it was very restrictive in the shape of the data that it accepted. So it required sound bites that were under five seconds in a wave file, uh, only mono and at a very low sample rate of 11,025 Hertz. Uh, unfortunately, I could not find any libraries that created the content in that form. So what I ended up doing was setting up two microphones in the front end, one that records specifically to send the audio to Web Empath and another one that sends it to IBM's Watson. The version that gets off sent to Web Empath is recording in five second chunks, sending that data to the back end, where on the server it is converting that to the wave file with a specific data type um, using a command line interface called SOX. And then as that data is being streamed out to Web Empath and returned to us, we then turn it into this beautiful chart. Uh, on to Tristan for the other half of the story. I think Tristan might be frozen. He just said that his computer just died, actually. All right. Well, then on to whoever is after Tristan. <laughs> It is me. Uh, I am Samir Cho. I worked on setting up a live practice section using Watson API. Uh, the challenge I faced was to save audio files for script take talking blocks in order and make user can access audio files. Um, to implement this feature, I first had to run API calls synchronously for multiple text. Then I made an array of invocation API calls, which save audio files and returns file path in, in the in the order of talking blocks. Then promisify the array so that all the, all the API calls can store the audio file synchronously. As a result, the server is able to send the, the array of file path to, to the client as a response. And, and to make user play, users play audio in, in the browser, I used the audio constructor which takes a file path and returns on returns a new HTML audio element that can be used off screen to manage and play audio. So audio could be played in the front by passing file path, which are passed from the server into the into the audio constructor, and I'll pass uh, yeah into audio constructor, and I will pass it up to Chandler to talk more about uh, live practice section. Hey everyone, um, my name's Chandler. I work together with Sam on the live practice component. Um, another challenge we faced was that when uh, playing a Watson generated audio clip, 
uh, we wanted the corresponding talking block to be highlighted and also to be scrolled into view for better user visibility. Um, and we did this by using React. And in order to handle the highlighting, we needed to differentiate the current audio clip that was playing from the rest. Uh, this was accomplished by having a pointer value in state to keep track of the index of the current playing audio file within our audio constructor array that Sam mentioned previously. Um, we would then pass the pointer's current value to the dynamically rendered talking blocks. And by using a ternary operator, we would then add an ID that we called highlight. And that would change the CSS for that specified talking block to be highlighted if its index matched the pointer's index or the pointer's value. Um, to add scrolling into view, we use the document function get element by ID. Uh, what that does is gives us an object representing an element specified by a given ID. So in this case, we would give it the ID highlight. And then we would then use the element method scroll into view when clicking a play button on the object that we got from get element by ID. Um, as the name implies, scroll into view would scroll the specified elements container into a position that's visible to the user if it was not already. And from there, I'll pass it to Tristan if he's back. Hi, sorry, I had my uh, computer freeze. Uh, so one of the challenges that I faced was, um, sorry, was uh, to take the large audio recording and turn it into text. So uh, after the user makes a recording, we get back a blob URL, which is just a DOM string that points to a URL that represents a buffer that represents the recording. So IBM Watson needs an audio file. It can't use a blob URL. So the challenge was to get a file from that blob URL. Um, first, we made a fetch request uh, to the blob URL to get a readable stream. And then we called the dot blob method on the response creating a buffer. Uh, then we pass the buffer to a file constructor to create an audio file which Watson could actually use. Uh, the last piece of the puzzle was to use a form data constructor along with the multi middleware to serve uh, to save the multi-part file to our file system. And then from there we could just read it and send it to Watson. Uh, and that's how we got it. Um, one of the challenges that we faced as a team was to coordinate the workflow of a seven person team. Uh, because the project involved a lot of people working on overlapping code, there was a potential for some nasty merge conflicts. Um, but Taryn provided us with a, a Git protocol that nixed this entirely. Uh, first, we were always to state when we were making pull requests so everybody knew. Anybody making a pull request uh, had to first do a code review of that uh, of any outstanding pull requests. And then third, they had to resolve any merge conflicts with their own branch before making their pull request. And that was super clean. We had no merge conflicts throughout the entire um, process. Um, and that is our presentation. Sorry for the hiccup. And uh, we can take questions. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you guys so much. I do have a question about um, real world application of your application. What, in what area do you see someone actually utilizing this? What was this built for? So one of the goals was uh, if, you, if you take the first component and the second component, component together, the actor could read the actual tone of a line that they're practicing or rehearsing so Watson will give them the tone of it. So it might be polite, it might be happy, sad. The second thing they can do is go to the voice analyzer and actually uh, read that, that line and get the emotional content of their voice to see if the tone and their emotion line up. So if the tone is happy and their voice is happy, they're doing good acting. <laughs> That's awesome. I have a couple of friends who are actually in the voiceover business, and I can see this being really, really applicable to what they're doing. They get uh, client requests all the time to have a specific tone, et cetera. And so that would be a great way to prove um, and to show that they are doing that. I, I think this is really, really impressive. And the, the analyzer is just mind blowing, truly. Um, so great job on this. And I, I 
if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to share. Um, but, uh, and any questions about anything else, thank you so much, Taryn, for putting the uh, link into the chat as well. Um, uh, I think if uh, Team Werewolf, if you would put your game into the chat as well, uh, just a note for everyone who opens the game, um, there can only be one game at a time. So if there's already a game in progress, you will get a notification that says you cannot um, play and to check in back later. But uh, if you want to play, you can't. So thank you everyone for presenting and thanks everyone for joining. This has been super fun and I am very impressed. So uh, I hope you all go on to, to have very fruitful careers. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.